and welcome. It is such a privilege to have you here with us this evening for a very important conversation. Uh, my name is Don Martin. I am the director of the Soul Center. And for those of you who might not know, for over 17 years, the Soul Center has sought to serve the diverse communities of San Antonio through programs that try to create spaces for interfaith dialogue, peace building, and striving towards the common good. And we know that tonight's event will continue in this long tradition of education, discussion, and greater understanding. As part of our mission, you'll see on the front of the program, our mission is there. And what we do is we try to create space and for folks engage one another in the spirit of respectful curiosity. We therefore look forward to an evening shaped uh, by what has been defined as the golden rules of conversation. Uh, some of these guidelines are be curious and open to learning from others as you wish they would be from you. Uh, look for common ground with others as you wish they would with you. We have copies of these guidelines, which are very helpful. You can take them to your next family gathering. Um, <laughs> if you would like to spend some more time, your thanks. We're going to Thanksgiving. Plan ahead. It's never too early. It's already almost February. Um, we have copies of these in the front if you'd like to spend some time reflecting on them. And now, I'm going to introduce the language to our panelists. Thanks to Bernice Kearney and to Elena Ayala and Bernice's team. Thank you so much for putting that video together. <laughs> Um, and I just want to take a moment now to turn our attention to the panelists after this thought-provoking uh, video that will generate some questions for us. And we're privileged to have this amazing group of panelists with us to help guide us and inspire us in our explorations um, together in the hopes of mutual understanding. It's my privilege to introduce the panelist moderator, Elena Ayala. For over 38 years, Elena Ayala has worked in and contributed to the newspaper business as a reporter and columnist for the San Antonio Express News. She has long reported on Latino politics, history, arts, and culture, together with covering diversity, demography, immigration, and more recently, religion. I'm happy to report that starting in February, Elaine will be a full-time Metro columnist at the Express News. So congratulations. <laughs> Very exciting. And while we will miss her work with the faith section of the paper, she has been very generous in her coverage of the Soul Center and other events that we are engaged in. So thank you again for that. Um, we are very, uh, we celebrate with you this new position. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ellen as our moderator. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, you could be, I don't know if it's, oh, should I be using, oh no, you're not, you're not, I'm live. <laughs> I just, it's magic. Um, we're coming out on a dream week. We know there's a lot of events out there that can pull you in one direction or another. We ha we're very happy that you're with us and with this wonderful group, really, of all my friends. And it's like um, having coffee, or better yet, wine. Uh, so we'll pretend um, and, and discuss this important issue. Um, we'll start with Francisco Vara Orta, a longtime uh, reporter for the Express News, who is now a national reporter and data specialist um, at Chalkbeat, a uh, um, education um, online news service. Um, and we'll ask him to reflect a little. He's, he's working on the national level. Oh, hi, Michelle. Hi. I'm so glad you came. Um, uh, <laughs> I love it when I see friends I haven't seen for a long time. Um, so, um, he, uh, Francisco has gone from the local level to the national level, now working from San Antonio, but doing stories all over the country. And one of my first questions to him is, we know it's Washington, this is very washington centered that all of the stories that you hear on CNN and other, and read on um, our newspaper and others is, it's coming out of Washington, that, those two words, fake news, seem to be coming out of Washington. But, you also report in cities all across the country. So what are you hearing? How is this phenomenon affecting people on the ground everywhere? Or is it just Washington centered? I, I definitely think it is not Washington centered uh, anymore, especially for various reasons. Uh, I mean, you have uh, the President of the United States sitting in and it's broadcasting to almost every home. So it's, it's kind of national now, uh, international really when you think about it. Uh, journalists across uh, the globe deal with a lot of um, similar accusations of being 
uh, fake news um, in, in various languages. Um, and so I think that uh, when I traveled around the country, I'd say the last three or four years since it was starting to be used more in political rhetoric, you see it more common. Um, I think just going to any of our news organizations, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, you see it used a lot. Um, and that goes down to the local level. Um, so I think it's, it's really pervasive now. Um, and it's, uh, I think after the uh, Capitol Gazette shooting, there came a, a point where newsroom management, I feel, understood that we need to talk a little bit more about the safety of reporters and um, uh, photographers that are going out there all the time. I think a lot of us for years just got in our cars um, and felt like we could just drive anywhere and be reporting and we wouldn't be called fake news. Um, but I've, I've had friends that have reported around the country that have been harassed, physically assaulted, um, you know, in St. Louis. And um, so I, mean, I, I think it's spread beyond just Washington. Um, Bernice, you um, work in a high impact, fast paced newsroom with photographers and, and reporters on the ground all the time. I think I've gone into your newsroom half a dozen times and it feels like, oh, nobody's there because everybody's out all the time and they're reporting back. So you must um, experience this in a different way um, with your staff. Uh, I think Francisco makes a great point, and yes, that's definitely true. We, um, when the Capitol Gazette shooting happened, that's when there were always concerns about the safety of our staff members who were out in the field, especially the early morning or the late, uh, late in the evening. I don't allow, for instance, reporters to go out by themselves and shoot their own stories or live shots in the early morning or the evening for that reason. Um, but when the Capitol Gazette shooting happened and all of a sudden it was like, oh, we need to be talking about exit strategies for the people in our newsroom. We need to be talking about bulletproof glass. We need to be talking about razor wire. We need to be talking about making sure that the people within the building, the receptionist who's at the, literally the front lines of our station, making sure that, that she is safe. We institute a policy where you cannot get into our building and if you do not have an appointment. And they will make you stand outside in the cold and the rain and the you know, heat or whatever because we do not know who is coming into our building. And for years, I've been there for 25 years, I mean, we used to never even have locks on the doors practically. You could just walk in. You could just come in and say, oh, I want to talk to someone with a, a reporter. I want to talk to someone in sports. I want to tell the news director or something, and that is just, it, we can't do it. And that presents its own problems because we are part of the community and we're supposed to be reflective of what's going on in the community. And we're supposed to be giving, uh, we, are, we are the voice of the community. And if they can't get to us, even for their questions, even for their concerns or their issues or uh, real world problems that we may be able to report on and, and make some significant changes to, then that becomes a whole different conversation. Uh, I not just, just very recently had a photographer who was attacked uh, in the street covering a fire at a house. So this isn't politics. This is not just politics. Yeah. This is, and they said, you're fake news. He's like, look, I, and they hit him, they knocked his camera over, it cost many thousands of dollars to get that fixed, and we are pressing charges. Because that is not the way a civil society should be working together. So this isn't just a political thing. This is a real world, everyday people on the street, reporters and photographers and, and journalists on the street who are having to deal with anger that is directed at the media for no other reason than we are very visible. Which is what happened at the Capitol Gazette. It wasn't uh, a charge of fake news. It was a, um, a, um, a long time grudge that the shooter had against the paper. Um, and this kind of goes back, this has been slow in building because uh, we can remember after 9-11, all of a sudden, um, all our mail was being sifted through in a different building other than 
the main building. Um, we, we then owned a small historic home um, on the premises and all our mail had to go, had to um, be sifted through and figured out where, yes, because of anthrax. So it's been a, a slow but steady buildup. Cheryl and Ann Lucas, who is the executive director of Nowcast SA, um, and please explain what that is for people that don't know, although I'm sure many do, um, has been teaching and preaching um, what is fake news for a very long time. And um, she's been a professor and, um, and still does so much mentoring for young journalists like the young woman who's at the camera in the middle of the sanctuary right now. So please uh, tell us how to track, how to um, how to understand, how to best scrutinize whether we're, what we're reading is a deep fake. Now Cast SA is, um, I, to shorthand for it, is I, I say it's sort of like a local C-SPAN because we go and show up at things and we we go bumper to bumper. We don't just do 30 seconds of, of coverage. And tonight we we're at four different places, including here, and one of them is um, the third night that we followed the um, uh, finalist city managers, um, and so this, and we will have complete video, and you'll notice the differences between his interactions with the neighborhood on the west side and his interactions with neighborhoods in Harburger Park and tonight at Big Town Hall downtown at UTSA, and the whole thing will be there for you. So that's part of what we do, and I have to say it gives me a huge, huge advantage because an awful lot of folks out there don't confuse me with the media. They think of us as a partner, and so I don't have I don't have a lot of baggage frequently that that um, gets in the way of things. But when I first went to the web, which was exactly 20 years ago, um, well, 20 years ago August, I went to the street um, on Wall Street, which is a, a startup um, for financial news and. A, People behind it were from Wall Street Journal and, and like that, but it was the beginning of the online news only. It wasn't taking newspaper content and putting it online. It was generating online news. And and the folks putting it together did some incredibly brilliant things, but it had to do with credibility in 1999. And that was the street.com launched with a code of ethics. The street.com launched with a corrections policy. The street.com launched with a complete transparency for all of the writers, and including freelance writers and stuff. So unlike the CBS Market Watch, um, our competitor, um, they would, if they, if someone told them that they'd made a mistake, they'd just change it. And so you were left wondering if you had lost your mind or whether you'd really seen that error. And at the street.com, all of the corrections were made and said and acknowledged that we made this mistake and thank you very much. There are other organizations that do that same kind of thing. Um, BuzzFeed, funny name, serious journalism. They have a really, really, really excellent <coughs> corrections policy and code of ethics. So that brings me forward to what I tell people now and tell students now. We've been doing um, workshops in what I like to call Crap Detection 101. <laughs> and, and you can go to the website and sign up for a workshop, and we do free workshops, and we do them age specific. So we'll do um, junior high level. Um, um, I do it actually for every time I teach a uh, journalism class, I end up having to kind of pull back and do 101 um, on craft detection. And I do it also for um, adults and seniors and all, all levels. But one of the first things I say to look for is. Um, does this publication that you're looking at, do they have a code of ethics? I mean, that's a really important thing to look for. I mean, we do, we launched with one. There are other local um, online-only publications in San Antonio that don't. And I think that's really, really important. That lets you know whether the publication takes ethics and transparency seriously. Um, can you find out who funds the organization? On, on my site, on Texas Tribune's site, on a lot of other nonprofit news organizations like us, you can see every single sponsor and you can frequently see um, in the story whether there's a relationship. So we're fortunate enough to um, have an extraordinary um, uh, credibility along with our address, which is that we're, our office is in Central Library on the sixth floor. Um, and in exchange for free rent, we live stream things in the library, which is why we have a YouTube playlist of Poets Laureate. 
Um, but, but that at the end of stories that involve the library, we say the library is an in-kind donor to Nowcast, so that you know we're not arm's length. You know, um, we're we're friends, <laughs> and and you need to know that. So throughout those throughout um, your examination of an article or a, a website, those are some of the key questions to ask. And I have a little cheat sheet that um, I think there are enough for everybody here, and would love to um, would love to uh, sure ask them. And um, for some of uh, the others, um, Denise Richter, who is going to speak soon, um, uh, sent over to me a lovely cheat sheet. Um, that she uses for her students, which we'll get to too, because there are there are fit, there is fitness. <laughs> um, we're not just we're not part of it, but um, so this is this is another handy guide for um, for Thanksgiving too. Um, I've had to explain at Thanksgiving and other times where a, a, a what looks like a legitimate news source, which you almost want to believe and you want to tweet and you want to share on Facebook, it's so easy to do, yet there you have to have safeguards because it, um, um, and viral videos as we saw just recently with the, the confrontation uh, between these young uh, white students and um, the Native American drummer and the first uh, video we saw may not have, we still the, the jury's still out on it the, the, it, it's it's a more expansive story. Um, there are still lots of things to worry about about those kids, but um, it's not that that viral video um, might have been misleading. So we'll get to the teachers. Um, uh, the teachers on this panel are fantastic. They are on the front lines of um, creating a new generation of journalists, and we need them. Um, and we're also very afraid that they're not going to be. In our museums. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I just remember there's one really, really important thing that, that goes along with this crack detection. And that is that in, in the world that we live in, we're all publishers, right? When you publish with your email, you publish with your Facebook, you publish, you're, you're a publisher. And so that brings with each of us the obligation to not throw an empty beer bottle full of crap out the window and think of this the way you thought of it with the Don't Mess With Texas, that we each have an obligation as you know, citizens of the internet to not broadcast crap and to surface things that are good. And she knows what he's talking about. This year is her 20th year on online journalism, so thank you for sure. Um, all right, Denise. Um, Denise is a professor at um, Palo Alto, and Kim Fox, our longtime um, metro, deputy metro editor of the Express News. We still miss her, it's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she's with Texas State, and both of them prepare some of just the best young journalists. Both of you really um, have have um, better our newsrooms for the, the journalists that do send to us and other newspapers and sites and stations in the city. So, um, looking at this um, dilemma that we're in, in which legitimate news reporters and editors are called fake, and actual fake news sites are believed, um, how are you both going about preparing these young journalists? What are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the worries that they that they they tell you? Move that microphone. I actually today was my first day of class for the spring semester, and I teach news reporting and writing. And so one of the first things I do is explain to my students that if they have an error of fact in any of their stories, which means a misspelled name, a wrong address, a wrong date, any kind of Factual information that is incorrect, they automatically will receive an F. Period. And I learned that from my, my mentor at Trinity University, Sammy Johnson, who it only happened to me one time. <laughs> I misspelled Arctic because my father's name is Art, so I blame it on him. And that was in the day before spell check where you know the, you get the little line underneath. So I spelled Arctic, A R T I C. Well, that was a matter of fact, and boom, I got the F, and that went in the great book. And as an A student, that didn't sit well with me, right? So, but it got my attention, and I never made another error of fact. And so I do that with my students to this day. And I tell them, 
you know, journalism is all about getting the facts right, about being not almost right, but absolutely right. And you can't play around with the facts because too many people are counting on you for correct information. You are their eyes and ears. They don't have the chance to go sit at a city council meeting and listen to endless hours of whatever's going on in the city. It's up to you to relay the information factually to them in a fair and balanced way. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a tough love thing. I'm not as hard as Sammy was. I do allow them to rewrite the story. They have to turn it in the next class period. If it was an A paper, it goes down to a B, B goes down to a C, C goes down to a D, but they learn. And I think I think they appreciate knowing. And in fact, I have a student last semester who comes from a very kind of uh, um, conservative background. And she said after class, you know, one of the things I asked four or five things you learned, she said, I'm really relieved to know that journalists really try their hardest to get things right. Because she, in her head, it was all fake news. She'd been told by people she's around, oh, it's all fake. And she learned that, no, it's not. It depends on the source. And that's a lot, a lot too, that you have to teach students. Who, who are you reading? Who are you looking at? Because I'll tell you, there's some news organizations that they're not really news organizations. They're propaganda outlets. And I think they are harmful to our society. And I don't think you should pay attention to them. You should in that you need to know what they're saying, right? So that you know what's out there. But you can't take it as the gospel truth because what is their motive? What are they trying to get across? And I find it very frightening right now that, that there are news organizations that have the public's ear and eye and people believe it. And it's an educational issue. We need people who are educated, who are critical thinkers, who do research, who take the time to figure out what, what really, what is right, what are the facts. And then try to listen to different sides. But um, it's, it's tough because we're all busy and who has time to do that? So we rely on the news media, credible outlets, to give us the news that we need to make decisions. And that's what empowerment is. And that's what the news, news media, I feel that, you know, I did my dissertation from, at the University of Texas on local television news and viewer empowerment. And frankly, how the, the public's main source of news falls short. That, that people are not empowered with information that they need to make decisions in civic life. We could do better. We should do better. Um, talk a little bit about what the worries are of your students um, heading off into um, a, uh, a news industry that has contracted, um, not just in newspapers, which are the, it's the obvious decline, but um, in, in, in news broadcasts and in radio stations. I mean, we, we basically have one in town, and, uh, and there are cities that don't have a, a public radio station at all. Mm -hmm. So what are they saying? What are their concerns? You know, um, I love students because they um, they aren't as concerned sometimes about stuff like that. Their parents, on the other hand, are freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of first-gen college students, right? So I often ask them, like, what do your parents think about this major? And somebody are going like, they, they don't know if I can make a living with this. And, you know, they can, right? And the other thing is, journalism skills translate. I mean, can you think of an industry that doesn't need somebody who can write well, research well, distinguish the facts, distill it into something comprehensible, right? Those are skills that translate. Um, so I love the ones who are really going for it and are really going to be journalists. Um, the, the thing that is worrying me more lately is actually what we talked about first, which is about journalists under attack. Um, and unfortunately, I've seen that at the college level. You know, we're college journalists, so this is um, a bit of a story, and, and you may have heard a little bit about it because it made national news, but Texas State has, got, has received more racist flyers and things than any other university in Texas. And so a columnist, um, a year ago in November, a columnist for the University of Star, which is a campus newspaper, we have 38,000 students on campus. The campus newspaper is a fully independent newspaper, which means we hire an editor who applies, right? So we hire the, the, an advisory board, hires the editor, and the editor, the student editor, is in charge, right? Um, she gets to make all the decisions, she hires her staff, she has the full first amount of protections, just like every media outlet up here, which is the way it should be. So they published a column, which is a column, right? Opinion 
column on the opinion page with the headline, Your DNA is an Abomination. And it was basically calling for the death of white privilege. It wasn't calling for the death of white people. It was calling for the death of white privilege. And it was pretty much in your face. It was very in your face. And they said, our university has been under attack to a great degree with racist flyers and things like that. So um, it caused a stir. And it got some national attention because the student body government, um, they called for the newspaper to be defunded, all sorts of things went on. The, the really difficult part in there is that there was so much um, hate pointed towards the student journalists. They got death threats. They had their photos put on flyers. The advisor had her children threatened. The building had to go on lockdown. I mean, this went on for a month, right? It was a good thing it was November and we were about to go into the break. I mean, it was horrifying. And still kept up a little bit after the break. The editor of the newspaper was um, a young woman who was a first-gen college student, a um, single mom who was in Dallas freaking out that her daughter was going through this. And she, at first, said, I'm like done with journalism. I mean, she kept in there, she managed her staff, they did journalism, they did all that. But in about February, she was like, like I, I don't think journalism is for me. So we had a lot of heart-to-hearts, and I said, you know what, you have to make those decisions. So we worked through a lot of things. And I'm not the advisor of the paper, but I'm head of the journalism sequence, so the journalism students were kind of like all my kids. And so she, um, she was out, and I was like, you know, I respect your decision. By May, she had applied to grad school and was like, no, damn it, like, I'm going. I am going to be a journalist. And she's doing a great grad school in New York City, on top of everything else, right? So not only did she, like, leave the little safe hamlet of San Marcos, Texas, but, you know, she's in New York City. And so, but it's still, the building is still on lockdown. You know, you still can't get into, it's the campus radio station and the campus newspaper. You can't get in um, unless you have a key card or you like knock and wave at the door. And we still haven't worked out the security stuff because it was such an emergency, so we still don't actually have an intercom. You just have to like knock and wave. And it's it's just so that sort of has been pervasive, right? There's still that feeling of like what do we what do we do here? Like how do we handle it? So trying to teach them through that and letting them know there's hope and you know you need to be prepared. But we need journalists. I'm like, you know what, you guys, like, you're my hope. It's like, please, you know, please don't give up. And there's, um, um, it reminds me that that there are people also in the room, and I want to call on one person who was on the front lines at Sutherland Springs, who has been on the border covering it. And you know, people like me who um, sit in an office, I get out to interviews, but I'm, I stay in the city pretty much. What I get are nasty emails. So sometimes I read them aloud to the rest of the staff so that you know we get a good like, oh yeah, another one of those people who hates the ground I walk on. But then it you, you let it slide. It's different when you're out there and you're in you're so recognizable as a member of the press. So Sylvia Foster Frau, who is, uh, if you could come forward and grab a microphone, I'd love for you to tell. Um, I'm gonna put her on the spot. Come over. Um, she um, she uh, is an award-winning journalist, young journalist, who um, who has spent a year at. Um, Sutherland Springs. I'd love for you for you to offer your um, your um, remembrances of being there, of of the people in this conservative town um, where you know everybody has a gun and um, reporting on guns in just yet another U.S. shooting was um, was a difficult experience, wasn't it? Tell them what what you you faced when you went to Sutherland Springs. Okay. Yeah, so I was um, one of the lead reporters in the Sutherland Springs mass shooting, which happened in November of 2017. Um, it was like the fifth deadliest mass shooting in the States. Um, and it's a rural, conservative, very religious community, and um, a lot of media came down. And I, was, I was down there that first day, and then I was kind of like embedded in that community for a year. And so I really got to watch kind of the transformation of the community's perception of me and our photographer, Lisa, um, as media. 
um, and watch that change over time and slowly become like another like family they're coming for a tour of the Express News tomorrow. But like it's special. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but in the beginning, um, these weren't people that were media friendly, and in fact, they actually had a really bad experience those first few days. A lot of national media came and like swarmed um, that town, and it was kind of bad on us, on all of us, that um, we overwhelmed this like town of 600 people with um, a lot of reporters and photographers, and. Um, because of that, you know, I like had the first experience I think ever being like part of that pack, like part of the media, you know. And so just facing people that were rude or uh, mean to me or just didn't trust me, you know, and like really seeing that in people's eyes that they were looking at me like I was an enemy and I wasn't used to like having that feeling of like, you know, before I even open my mouth, they see my reporter and it's like it's over, you know, it's done. Um, and so. I guess it's a tribute to like what what real news and especially what local news does is that you know we stayed with that community and I kept trying and so after the national media left you know me and Lisa our photographer were there you know every weekend at church and like still trying to show them um, that we're just people too and we're just doing our jobs and I think it helped to like showing them telling them about our mission and like what we wanted to do which was to tell their story and that and you know why telling news was important and, and kind of our role in it and just being really transparent because I feel like a lot of people see the media as this like kind of other or like elite world you know of, and like who knows what goes on behind the scenes of the media kind of thing like in the similar way that we think about like politics in DC you know it just feels so like different than us and so I felt like opening up to them and just being transparent and showing them my notepad and like this is what I'm writing and yeah, I have this recorder, I'm going to listen to what you say later, and then we're going to put it, and then I'll talk to my editor, do you want to meet my editor, you know, like, just, like, really trying to open up and show them that this wasn't, like, some, like, conspiracy or some kind of, like, uh, I don't know, that we're just, like, all people doing our jobs, too, and um, I found that was really helpful. And that relationship um, of the community really knowing the media is hindered by these locked doors, these, um, so we're battling this safety issue with how accessible we are. And I have to admit that I went to the Castro announcement a couple of Saturdays ago, and all of the media were issued a badge that say, you know, Castro 2020 press, and uh, we're allowed in, and so you can tell who they are, and, and there was a huge batch of, um, and so even though one would, one might assume that, okay, it's a democratic crowd, maybe you're safer, but I, have, I thought twice um, with who was tapping me on the shoulder and wanting to talk to a reporter, because you're out there and you're, very, you're vulnerable. So, and you've been at the border too. What was the experience like there? Um, yeah, so I'm actually an immigration reporter. That was like, Southern Springs was like a separate kind of more random thing that I ended up getting wrapped into. Um, and so I've been down to the border a few times and, uh, you know, with like border patrol officials and um, government workers and also just like knock on doors to get people's um, opinion overall about the situation down there. And um, as you all know, it's like immigration is a really polarizing issue right now. And I've noticed just even on like a personal level, like when I meet new people and I tell them I'm an immigration reporter, it like it gets met, like, I, like my job is suddenly like, like a controversial job where um, before I was an education reporter and it was just like a lot more like everyone was like, Happy to talk about that. Not <laughs> always. Not always, not though. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Let's transition to that. Um, and um, yeah, I guess it's just um, a lot more. You get confronted with a lot more difficulty with access and and with people being honest to you and opening up to you. It gets a lot harder um, when they don't want to talk to you and they kind of see like you're not reporting on the on the two arguing factions, it's like you're part of the story, like you're one of the controversial aspects of it. Thanks. Um, uh, we want to open up to questions as well, but yes. Yes. Um, thank you, Sylvia, for just <laughs> following out of the audience. <laughs> um, journalists, they think on their feet. <laughs> 
Um, one thing that's really interesting, I think, the thing that she said about journalists being, you know, separating ourselves, right, and being um, apart from real people, is that it's interesting. There was a study done last year, and one of the findings was that, you know, it used to be that everybody knew a journalist. Right? I mean, journalists were like, they were everywhere, every, you know, everybody had one in their neighborhood, or, you know, you just knew there were a lot of journalists. Um, and, and, like, I wonder, like, how many people in here actually know a journalist, or, or have met a journalist, or whatever, you know, so, you know, I mean, actually, that, that's good, that's right? Really good, and really I, good that's probably a testament to, like, we have, we have local, right, we have more local journalists in San Antonio. We used to have a lot more local journalists in San Antonio. A lot more. And that's one of the things that's happened is, you know, when I was at the Express News, we had more than 300 journalists. I bet there are 117. Yeah, now. And um, 09 was probably the most devastating day I ever had there, or two days, because it took two days to let go of about 90 journalists. And then there were um, smaller bouts of this. Um, layoffs and also um, uh, buyouts. And, uh, and we're still the largest news gathering entity in the in the city. We're still bigger than anybody else, um, than it's, than any one television station, than any other one uh, printing or online site. And we're stretched super thin to cover all of the things that we used to cover. Like right now, uh, since I'm now going to be a, a full-time columnist. We don't have a religion writer right now. Can I ask, how many of you follow journalists on social media, like on Twitter and on Facebook and on? See, I think that's where maybe you have to knock and wave to get in. Uh, but I feel much more yeah. connected to journalists these days that's via right. social media than, than before. Right, that you're able to kind of send a tweet or to send a direct message and say, hey, here's a story idea or here's something you need to know about. So maybe that's that's answering. That is that. another way to keep that door open, even yeah. though the, the physical one is closed. Yeah. Yes, Charlie, you were about to say something. I, I was just talking about the, the number of, of journalists in newsrooms, and, and, and I think that one of the newsrooms that Kim and I used to work in many years ago in Mesa was eight. And that was we, we did some remarkable things with Dave. Yeah, and that was a that was a small paper. Yeah. Mason, Texas. Mesa, Arizona. Oh, Mesa. And the reality is that over uh, time, so many newspapers have not just uh, um, uh, reduced their staff, but closed all together. They've been bought up by weird sounding hedge funds and um, investment groups. Uh, one was actually called the News, News Investment Group, and they gobbled up a lot of little papers that kept the most um, uh, money, kept the money makers and closed the others that were. Um, and so, therefore, small communities were left for nothing, with no local media looking after their city government and therefore less oversight. Can I yes. speak to that? Yes. Because the same thing is happening with broadcast companies. So, whereas 20, 30 years ago you had a number of small ownership groups that they might own one news. Uh, uh, broadcast TV station, or they might have a group of five or a group of ten, and that was pretty much it. Now you've got these mega companies that have bought and, um, co and combined so that you've got more uh, communities that are maybe served by only two media companies versus the four that they had five years before. So all of that is to say that that further complicates having truly local voices and local coverage of a community, whether, I mean, I remember the days when we had two daily papers, yeah. you know, and you lost the, when you lost the light, you lost half of the people who were asking tough questions of elected officials. How are your tax dollars being spent? What, where is the infrastructure uh, uh, being, dollars being committed to? Um, and, and so, that has not just happened in newspapers. That has definitely happened in um, newsroom, broadcast newsrooms, and digital newsrooms now, and just everything. But uh, that that's a really very big deal. And I mean, the company I work for is 
one of the smaller in terms of how many stations we own, we own six. Uh, we happen to be in larger cities for the most part, but San Antonio is the second smallest. Um, and then we have a, a station in Roanoke. But Which is the number one station? We are the number one station in town. And we've got the largest broadcast staff. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, 90, 95, we will be 96 people total. Well, that's, in the very, that's very competitive for broadcast. And the most beautiful newsroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, one of the things that we want to do here is also have some interaction with you so that you get an opportunity to tell us how your local media is doing, how you can decipher fact from fiction, and what are your concerns? Don, do you want to come in? I was just going to grab the microphone okay. so I take, we'll take it up to folks. <clears throat> I would love also while we're preparing for that, some of you might reflect on echo chambers. Oh, so we haven't had, we haven't got, dove into that just yet, so while well, um, well, people are thinking yeah. questions, you well, might want so to talk about echo chambers, chambers for a little bit. Although the acoustics in this place is so fabulous that, you know. She didn't necessarily yeah, need it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm more of a prank guy, so I don't really broadcast my voice uh, too often. But, um, so, you know, we talked a, a little bit about uh, where people get their news, and I think there's a couple of concerns I have about echo chambers. Like, one is, um, when you sign up for Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you are, there's so many algorithms. So you're already being fed, already when you're clicking on. So that's one method that I think we're seeing the echo changes, right? And then also, um, and now you can, uh, you know, avoid, uh, I think, news packages that are, uh, like, if you, uh, I noticed, like, when you download an app on, like, Roku, you can kind of have self-selecting news reports brought up, so they'll be through Fox News or MSNBC, kind of whatever is more of the um, ideology of the news network, and so, you're starting to see, I think, that that in a polarization way that's really troubling to me because I remember growing up with the paper and it was like, whether you like it or not, you saw a variety of stories, a variety of information. Um, and so there's been an argument about are we just serving the consumers like we should from a market-driven perspective or what what is our responsibility as journalists to make sure that you're getting what we call the meat and potatoes and not just the cotton candy. Um, and so. That's something that concerns me, and I think also an aversion to who the storytellers are sometimes, or skepticism about them. And I, this this goes back to like identity politics right now, and that people feel, um, you know, I think younger news consumers want to see themselves reflected in the content and in who is delivering the content. They want to see less uh, older white men running these media organizations. I think for a lot of us, they were classically trained in journalism. You know, we wanted to stay away from our identities in a lot of ways because we wanted readers to feel like we were impartial, we were unbiased. Um, but, you know, when I go out into the community and I can speak Spanish or I have some other kind of identity connection with the groups I'm covering, there's a certain appreciation that I see and that I feel and that information I get. Um, and so it's something that, um, I feel like sometimes when I read stories about immigration as a Latino, there has been some skepticism about maybe where my bias might, might be, or um, you know, whatever my ideology is or what people think I am, and like, oh, of course he's going to write that or present that. And so I think people, what concerns me is that I think we naturally go to places we feel comfortable as humans, but now we have all this this technology that kind of predestines what we're going to see, and so you kind of get reinforced in that way. And so that's something that you just have to push yourself out of those zones. Um, and that's what we're supposed to do as journalists. And we get in trouble too, because sometimes we go to the same sources all the time. And um, you know, who's the most reachable? And it's going to be some elite people at some universities, as opposed to like spending time in the community. That's another echo kind of chamber. So you really just have to scrutinize, like, are you getting the full picture? And nothing beats just being out there in the community with the people because that's when you know what the truth is. You see a more representative picture, and not like in this case of this video where you see one sliver, but you don't see all the other components, and that's what a bond is. But I, I'm concerned about our delivery methods of getting that out. 
Okay. Yes, there's a question back there. Just uh, as an aside, we've been subscribing to the Express News for decades now, and we're very happy to see you that. Uh, we also get a lot of our news from Texas Public Radio, and I was wondering if someone could comment on the place the TPR now occupies in the news media scene. Is that good? I'm not sure I had a question. Uh, the, the, the question was, what is the place that Public Radio plays in the local media news area? And, and I, um, I think actually uh, Nowcast has partnered with Texas Public Radio as often as possible, um, and um, and I've also been um, worked in Philadelphia, Wilmington, Dallas, Phoenix, San Francisco, and Austin, and always had a really good relationship with the public public broadcasting people in those places. And I think um, public radio is just one of the bright spots here. And, and across the country um, in terms of local news. And I've watched Texas Folk Radio grow and really expand and become just a, a huge part of this community. From, I, from when we first got there in 1995, it was way less than a lot of other places. Well, yeah, they're one of the places that's hiring journalists, not playing right, 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 they are. And, and, and they're going to move into a lovely new building uh, behind the Alameda Theater uh, the building already existed, it's being built <coughs> for them. And the um, general, the CEO and president of uh, TPR says that it will be able over many years um, uh, double its staff. And, and, and what you're seeing is that they're, they're nimble enough, they were small enough to be nimble and to be trying new things. And you That's see right. Joey Palacios out there all the time sadly without a tripod, but um, <laughs> Facebook live and things come and, and, and doing it because he can and because it, it adds to things um, just the same as we see um, Sue Calvert doing a lot of that as well. Um, you know, so, so, so the people are taking opportunities to do more um, and, and I also think um, they're aiming their focus really strategically at, at things to cover. But, um, and, and they're also partnering with us guys, they, although they do have a thank you for being, a, for being a subscriber and for listening to TPR and hopefully also making your, um, uh, uh, making your um, money, uh, put your money where your mouth is and, and add to those pledge drives because that's what keeps us afloat. I mean, we, um, um, we're very cognizant of, of um, subscriptions, we're very cognizant of who is buying um, advertising, even though there's that great big divide. Um, we're all in one building now. We used to be so big that we were spread out at four buildings. The light building was sold. It's going to become a multi-use retail um, living center. It's going to be gorgeous. Um, and the other two buildings were sold along with it. So we're all of us are in one building now. Any more questions or comments? Uh, yes, back there. <clears throat> I'm your average uh, coward. I'll let you in on a true story. I wish you would have been there. Uh, several years ago at the uh, uh, Martin Luther King uh, meeting where all the everybody's there and we talked about the future. And it was a few weeks away. Uh, and, uh, really crazy what happened, but it happened. Homeland Security was there and they gave Homeland Security the floor. Um, by one of the people saying, they say, look, Homeland Security is going to be at the event, so you guys need to know that, and kind of like we're okay with it, you know, and uh, they're going to uh, be working the event. And, and uh, I, I, I was floored, and of course, like I said, I was a coward. I, inside, I was telling me, get up and say, hell no. I didn't do it. I was, this is one of the first years I was in the front. Can't believe what happened. <laughs> Homeland Security went up to several reporters, a bunch of them, said MCRD. Again and again and again, again, the average coward, I saw it. I didn't do it. I didn't see nothing again. We are, we, we are in a hell of a lot of trouble. And I've been in Mali Gras 10 times. They have these huge uh, generators with a pole. A lot of cameras on him, and it says Homeland Security. I asked the cops about it. I said, What's that? I don't know. 
says Homeland Security. This is where we, uh, long story. They, they, the cops there didn't know where it was. So I, had to, I had to go over there and read the, the sign on the side of the deal. Like I said, we are in a hell of a lot of trouble. Do you have a question or? Well, yes. <laughs> what? Where is the phone number? Where is the place when we see something this bad? And who, how are we going to do something about this to slow it down, get it out there, and so the average American knows what the hell's going on? I think um, the question is, uh, I think that's the beauty of Twitter. I'm a huge fan of Twitter. Uh, I know a lot of people aren't, but I think we're all citizen journalists. So if you see something, it's like in the airport. See something, say something, right? Mm -hmm. Then we can have the ability to capture it, photograph, video, whatever, and, and upload it. I really do think that that's, that's what we all can do as citizens is, is you know, deputize ourselves as getting information out there. And the and the the, true, the full story if you can do it. So it's not just a snippet, you know, that, that is biased. But if you're if you're trying to, to get the information out there, tell the story, tell the full story. I'd love to go back just a little bit, Elaine, to what you mentioned. You kind of broached the topic um, for the first question, and we had broached this also in the, in the description of this event. Is that line between nonprofit and for profit? How? is being for-profit. How does that impact the mindfulness now that you're all in the same building for the Express News, but also for other folks that um, are engaged in, in an industry that requires revenue to generate, to, to be productive, and even thinking at, at universities, there are donors, there are boards, there are trustees. Does that impact? Um, and it may not, since that's a little bit removed. But just to toss out that question about for-profit, non-profit, how that shapes coverage and topics discussed. Newspapers have always been for-profit. We're called the fourth estate because we're removed from government. We are independent. But as, um, you know, heading back to the beginnings when uh, Benjamin Franklin and several others were putting out newsletters which were newspapers, um, it's, it's always been a profit business. We, the model has worked for a very long time. Um, the um, the um, internet crushed that model, and we still haven't figured out how to make money at a model in which um, so much that you click on is free. So when you go to our site, you might be allowed to see a little portion of the story, but you can't see the full story. I can't tell you how many relatives will call me up and say, can you send me the rest of that story? <laughs> because they don't have subscriptions. Um, so um, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I do know that the, that the non-profit model is being tried in a lot of places, including San Antonio, to uh, varying uh, success. Um, and it brings with it other sets of problems. Because in the nonprofit model, you will accept funds from foundations, you'll get grants, you might sell an ad from time to time, you might be, um, you might be beholden to whomever um, is buying that ad or buying influence. Of course, that's been said of the newspaper industry from day one. What I can tell you is that, and Kim and, and Francisco and Charlotte, who's been at the paper, um, there's such a separation, uh, um, church and state. We even have a, a, a church and state separation from the editorial page and the newsroom and those that uh, gather the news and write the news in unbiased, straightforward ways, and those people that um, write opinion. Those barriers still exist, even though we're all in the same building. Uh, I, we famously, um, uh, somebody said, uh, you know, the, the coffee machines are a lot better on the third floor where advertising sits. <laughs> and, uh, and we have a little trouble with our coffee machines, but even so, very few wander off to the third floor. It's like, you know, I know they have a better curate, but I just think we ought to be separate. <laughs> um, so um, it's a, it's a um, we respect what they do. And we, I, when I see um, advertise, uh, advertising <coughs> of, of something on the elevator, I always say, please do a good job. We need the money. Um, but we're very separate. And once there are um, 
an attempt to an attempt to um, to break down that wall when someone in advertising makes an effort to call a reporter and the editor doesn't know of it. There's hell to pay. I mean, I'll, I'll tell the editor, the editor to say, hey, if you have an idea from one of your advertisers, send send to me. Let me handle it. Um, so uh, they're still very much, even though we're so close together, they're very much in play. <coughs> I'm not sure I'm, I'm a nonprofit. I have, I have a quick story about um, newspapers and, and advertising and how serious the wall is. Um, when I was in Dallas, I did a story about the largest Mercedes Benz dealership in town rolling back the dollars. And um, that cost the newspaper all of the Mercedes Benz advertising. And I was in the cafeteria one day, and the ad salesman who had lost the entire account um, pulled back to take a swing at me. And um, he was actually banned from the floor for life by our editor. So, um, I can't yeah. he was actually allowed to continue working there. Yeah, exactly. But, what's long time ago? But, but the, 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 the um, non-profit model, which Nowcast adopted when we were incorporated in 2009, I can't believe we're, it's been 10 years. But um, initially, we felt like, oh, we'll just do the same thing as Texas Public Radio and KLRN, and we will have, you know, a whole bunch of people will buy memberships, and we'll get grants, and we'll get donations, and, and we'll all live happily ever after. And um, <clears throat> it's proven to be a lot more complex than that. And and um, I'm, I'm a founding board member of the local independent online news publishers. There are more than 200 of us across the country trying to invent the future of news and information. Some are bootstrappers, some are nonprofits, some are for profits, and we're all figuring out ways to be sustainable. Um, our, our model at, at Nowcast grew to, after we live streamed so many things so well, people said, how much would it cost if you, and we it developed a business in live streaming events. And, and so what we do to, um, Sunday we're going to be live streaming the Blessing of Peacemakers, and they probably will give us a sponsorship of about $500 to do it, um, which is nowhere near what it costs us to do that. But there are other instances where somebody like CPS Energy will say, would you please come in and live stream our 75th anniversary? And, and everything is completely above board. They're paying for this. They're in charge of content. We're not changing content. I mean, we do it. And they can afford to pay for it in a manner that lets us go stream the Blessing of Peacemakers on Sunday. Um, but we have to diversify our revenue streams. And that's something that newspapers did as well, right? So um, years ago when newspapers realized that the most popular section in the paper was the obituaries, um, newspapers, I would argue, um, um, took the first step of suicide by starting to charge for those things and charge such, a, so such an incredible amount of money that it's, it becomes part of the, the, the death industry that's, uh, that's bizarre. And so, I'm um, I'm going to get into the obituary business at a much lower level than that and preserve some of the oral histories in this community and also it's another step toward sustainability for us. So I mean it's it's a question of the yeah, we're all trying to figure it out. Right. Mm -hmm. By the way, the fake section exists and persists because the opits are in there every right. Sunday. <laughs> and I've always said that if, if uh, the editor, uh, when we have a new one, decides, you know, I'm gonna put those in the business section, well, once again, we'll have a Sunday business section because it will be sustainable too. I, I just wanna throw in um, one thing that really concerns me, and that's that all the universities are different. You know, we are the training ground of tomorrow's journalists. And a number of college newspapers are shutting down because they are also advertising based. It costs money. You know, whether or not you have a print edition, it still costs money, right, to put out a newspaper even if it's just online. And so um, we're especially seeing some private universities close their papers because there were like foundations that funded the paper, and as they start to run out of money, the private university says, oh, we'll just take it on into the journalism department. The problem is the private university um, newspapers don't have the same First Amendment protections. So at a private university, it's like a business running a newspaper that says we're in charge of the content. So if the president of the newspaper, I mean, the president of the university doesn't like a story, they can, you know, 
acts it, and that's a problem. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a problem. And that's possible. happened all in the country. Have you know, it happened at a kind of board thing <coughs> when they shut the newspaper down. I just wanted to say, if you all are not subscribers to the Express News, I really think you ought to be. Uh, think, of it, think of it as a charitable contribution. <laughs> the reason why I say it, I mean, I really do, I, I really believe this because they do the hard-hitting journalism, and we need to fund journalists doing good work. I also wish that Hearst, who owns the Express News, would somehow do like, um, HEB does with their employees, and if the journalists become like stockholders and help share in the wealth. Because I don't think people at the Express News have, and not only have they had layoffs, they haven't had a raise in about. It's 11 years. They haven't had a raise in 11 years. That's just not right. Have, but very, very few. Yeah, that's not right. So I wish that there could be a more equitable way to share the wealth, because somebody's making money. Right. Oh, they're making, we get letters from, uh, we, we got one today, in fact, a letter from First Corp um, congratulating all of us for, for um, creating such a favorable um, uh, financial year. And of course, Hearst is very diversified, so on the top of that list were some of their healthcare um, entities that, are, that they've invested in, in um, medical um, businesses, and they're the fastest growing and the most um, money-making ventures. Um, but all together, um, and one of our reporters, he's close to retirement, but he called me over today and said, what do you think of this note? And it was just two sentences, and it said, uh, congratulations on the great news of our financial success. Um, it was met with some dismay at the San Antonio Express News newsroom, where we have not had races in 11 years. Um, couldn't you share a couple of a few, a little bit of your um, of your money with um, the hardest working people people on your staff? And so we'll see how far that note gets. But it, it was sent today, and so it's constantly on our minds because um, you know the only way we um, keep moving forward is by shaving expenses, just like governments do. Um, and uh, but many, many of my colleagues, including me, have not had a raise in eleven years. And I need to point out, um, in terms of, of for-profit newspapers, if you go back to the 1980s, um, the return on investment for newspaper owners was somewhere north of 25%. Um, uh, in Phoenix, when I was there, it was 27%. When I, when I came here, I was aware that it was it was somewhere around 24, 25%. Now, the return on investment at, at um, General Motors, on um, really good years, is 3%. So, really, 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 really highly profitable, and and I think I yeah, think I, I don't know. Grocery, I think grocery, the grocery business, if, if they have a five percent year, it's considered a lot of year. And so, and so, when newspapers said they were losing money, it really was a question of making less money than they used to make, and the the publicly traded ones like. The Knight Ritter um, had to be had to just leave the market because they couldn't return those make those kinds of returns. Hertz, as a private entity, can still do it because it doesn't publicly disclose. Francisco wanted to. So one other uh, going back to the to the theme of tonight, talking about you know media and a polarizing world. I think also a challenge for us as an industry is to explain to folks these lines. And it's not always the most interesting and the most sexy story to put out there. I mean, we're there to report what's happening in the community. But I've noticed that there's been more of a desire in the last three or four years to try to explain how our industry works, because folks still don't know sometimes the difference between news and opinion. And so I remember being a reporter at the Express News, and this uh, editorial board would write something, and it would basically say they disagreed with something or they thought this politician had made a bad move or they, you know, it, I knew colleagues that during the presidential election in 2016, um, the uh, newspaper endorsed Hillary Clinton and had not endorsed the Democrat, I think in like 78 yeah, years. Yeah, I know. It was, I mean, it was like, a talk. <laughs> yes, I think it's reconstruction. Um, so, like, my colleagues were like, all of a sudden they would just go out in the community and start talking to people and they were like, oh, like, I don't want to 
haunting because you guys were Hillary. And so that and it had nothing to do. Like they were like, I'm reporting on like grocery prices going up or something. Or you but, central independent school it has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. And so um, I think there's like a, a mystique that we're still trying to break down about some of this works between editorial and news and also just like our funding models and that there is this line between advertising, working both in for-profit and non-profit now, there are those lines um, that are drawn up in, in contracts with funders. Um, but I, I mean, all that's new, and I don't think a lot of people understand that. So that's kind of on us to figure out how to get that message out. And I, I think we have an obligation as publishers always to, to make it really, 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 really clear what is an opinion or a commentary piece. Um, and we do that, and some other local organizations do not do that. And I think that's really important because I think people confuse, if you don't label it opinion analysis or commentary, people confuse that with, with straightforward. And even when you label it, it's just confusion. Uh, I read um, I read at Al Radio, so we read the Express News for the Blind, and they have special radios to listen in, and almost the entire paper gets read almost every day. And so, um, and there's a lot of volunteers, and and even after reading the paper for a really long time, there's confusion among them too that this is the editorial page. So you guys read that one because the news goes on an hour before, and so we have to continually train. And I noticed that um, for a while, um, if my byline for my column would say uh, columnist, and it was recently changed to commentary. Uh, it was a personal decision, but it was like another effort, like to shout, tell you, this is not a straight news report. This is uh, someone's opinion. And uh, sort of on the same lines, but um, something that I think is really important for people in the community to understand with regard to reporting and the way media works now in a very fast world. We, we talked about Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram and you know all these other things and the way reporting has evolved and the, the way the uh, deadlines have shifted, it's almost like there are no more deadlines. The deadline was five minutes ago and we are feeling, we the collective we, and I'm sure the, the same can be said amongst all of us, we are in a big hurry to get information out to people because people are in a big hurry to find out what's going on. And, and so we, uh, where it used to be, you know, tune in at five, tune in at six, tune in at 10, tune in the next morning at five or six or whatever, uh, that, that world no longer really exists because people have an expectation of immediacy. And so we get, we get dinged a lot when the story is evolving and we are telling the story as it evolves. And information changes. Uh, go out to a scene and the police officer, the sergeant on the scene, may understand this to be what happened. And then as they conduct their investigation and talk to witnesses and uh, do crime scene analysis and do fingerprinting and do whatever the case may be, that story over the course of an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, can evolve very differently. We weren't spreading fake news because we reported one thing when the incident occurred. We were telling the story as it continued to evolve. And I think, I know, because my reporters and photographers told me today about these things, when I asked them to tell me what they wanted to make sure that the audience understood is that their, their stories are never quite 100% done. There's always something else that happens to change the story, to change the information, or to evolve the facts. And um, that's, that's new-ish in the last 10 to 20 years, really. Um, you know, it's no longer appointment television. It's no longer just the, the, the newspaper gets delivered to your front door at 6 a.m. and there it is for the rest of the day. They post stories all the time. 
they tweet, we tweet, we put out information all the time, and, and especially in uh, real world scenarios that are quickly evolving, Sutherland Springs being an excellent example of that. Um, you just, I, we need the public to understand that we too are trying to get to the truth and we're trying to get you the truth as quickly as possible. One of the things that the Express News used to do is to have a, a board of advisors that were selected for the entire year. Um, it fell off the grid because all the people that used to do it used to have the time to do it, and now they're all, you know, they're doing two or three jobs. But one of the things that came out of there, first of all, we got terrific story ideas from a diverse number of people that were selected from all over town, but also that they learned more about our business, and they often came into the newsroom, and some of them were real critics of the, of the newsroom. They were, um, you know, champions of grammar who were just aghast that here you have this big story, and on the jump, there was a misspelling and the wrong verb used. And I remember one, one little guy came once, and he just like, you know, just really wiry, and you know, uh, it was just very upset that we get things wrong like that. And after a half a day with us and learning how, you know, we decide, we think thoughtfully, you know, this is the biggest story of the day, let's give that the most play, and this is a softer lead, let's put it down below, and, and all of the conversations that happen and he said to us at the end, oh, now I, I just don't know how you get it done so quickly and so well. <laughs> so there's, there is an appreciation at when you know more about what we do. Yes, sir. That's a comment. I think it's a pretty good idea. I'm, I'm kind of an idea guy. What you were saying about the paper, uh, I really think it would be a perfect time to go network marketing on it or MLM. You're not going to become a millionaire, you're not going to get paid, but maybe you'll, uh, become, it'll be, you'll be recognized if so you sign up two people, they sign up two people, become subscribers, they sign up two people, they sign up two people. We might get revolutionized the pay, newspaper business in this country, because if it catches fire, uh, prescri prescriptions will go 1,000%, 10,000%, or 1,000%. Like, I'm keen off your idea of you're saying you should become um, subscribers. Well, why don't we ask the paper if we can make it an ML network marketing, like all these women who become millionaires to Mary Kay and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You don't get paid. You just get the recognition, hey, so-and-so Mary, she signed up 100,000 people down the line. What? And, you know, <laughs> weeks, and, uh, seriously. So we just a question. Maybe we can ask a question saying, like, like, what are some, are there some new creative ideas what that are available? About, you know, what do you think about the idea I just shared? <laughs> They're out there. Sure. No, no, the idea I just talked about. Can somebody make a comment? Oh, Show, did you want to make the comment? Show us yes. Hodia, the creator of Dream Week, is with us tonight. Thank you, thank you. Good morning to the panel. Um, I'm, I'm 15 minutes late for my next. <laughs> and only because it's so interesting and your views and what you've shared here is really engaging. And um, we probably need more of this. So, Elaine, um, you were always there for us. I remember the very first, you described me as, what was it, Peach, you know, was creative, gen some genius or something. <laughs> I, was, I don't know what it was. I, I, I love words like that. Yeah, and people were calling me back, calling me, I thought that won some Oscar or something like that. <laughs> Nigeria. Well, you know, uh, so, the great thing you. about show is here he is a uh, San Antonio Nigerian born, educated in England, um, lived in New York, and of course falls in love with the woman that brings him to San Antonio. <laughs> so that, I love those stories. You know, love conquers all. And he brings us Amen. And I'm glad we have more women on the panel than men. <laughs> okay, well, Heather, thank you so much. For I'm sure the show is going to his 80th um, event of Dream Week. <laughs> no, I couldn't miss this. And my dear uh, Dawn, and she's been tremendous. I just wanted to just really thank you for your support of Dream Week and just support of exchanging ideas in all of San Antonio as well. Nowcast, Express News, I can't mention every single person here, but I just really want from the bottom of my heart, this is my dream come true. I'm going to four or five events and everybody's hailing me as some 
miracle worker, but ultimately we, every single one in this room, is doing exactly what Dream Week is about, and it's only going to get bigger. So thank you so much. Thank you. Trump supporter 
and was putting out information on Twitter that was not factual. So as a journalism professor, I feel like it's my duty to counter that with the facts and to kind of broaden her perspective of things that are actually out there. And I don't know if you know, the Washington Post has been doing a really great kind of counting of all the number of lies that have been told from day one. And I just shared that link with her. <laughs> I don't think she'd ever seen it before. You know, so I really do think, again, as, citizen, as citizens, it's our duty to inform our friends, our families, our neighbors that, hey, you may think that this is the truth because that's all that you've heard, but actually, take a look at this. And I've had to do it with my own family. You know, and, and even my mom sent out an email just luckily to her, her four, you know, one of them, um, the oldest of four, her four children, that was just like, you know, I was like, oh my God, thank God she put it on Facebook. And I said, Mother, you know, where did you get this? She said, well, Beverly gave it to me. You know, and Beverly, in her mind, was a, a credible source. She was my Texas history teacher in eighth grade. And so Beverly sent it, it must be real. And so I, I then sent my mother a link to Snopes. There's also uh, pro, well, factcheck.org and what's the other one? Politifact. Politifact. You know, so there are resources that you can go to, to to check facts. We don't have to do all the research ourselves, but I think people need to know about those resources so that before they put stuff out, they, they, they run it through Snopes, they run it through these organizations so that bad information isn't repeated. And please, we offer free workshops. Please sign up <laughs> um, and and share it. But I think that as as journalists, we have an advantage in the online world, um, and that is to, with every single piece we publish, show people why they shouldn't just take our word for it. So we think of many of our stories as sort of a toolbox. So there are more links in those stories. For more information, click here. For more information, go here. To figure this out, go here. And we're also starting to, to take action and go here. And you know, here's how to get a hold of your famous person. But I think we, we have this incredible ability. And I, during campaign season, and we're getting ready to go into a, a race again, um, I publish um, all of the League of Women Voters candidate forums on video, but I also pick up your great videos when they're when they're you know the nonpartisan things that that are um, moderated by you. I, we just link everybody together so that that so that there's a, a way to find credible factual information. And and I'd like to add to that because this is actually a conversation that we've had uh, both in my newsroom and in my company's within our company and then uh, outside in some some programs that I'm part of and you know uh, a lot of us are very competitive you know news organizations are competitive uh, we compete against other TV stations newspapers compete against newspapers you know websites compete against websites but I think that um, as, as part of that transparency and also part of the education of our constituency, we have to look and say, you know, we've got to set aside our ego and if KSAT's going to be a leader in trying to educate the world, our little world, our little corner of the world, then we have to be willing to link out to the paper. We have to be willing to link out to Nowcast. We have to be willing to say, they have a good perspective on this particular issue and not be afraid to send the, the reader to them. Uh, that is a heavy, heavy lift for a woman like me who has been deeply competitive <laughs> in a very real way um, at the same place and, and have, I've you know, worked very hard to be the number one news cast and, and, and all of that. But there, I think there's a shift. And you see it on the national level where the New York Times is linking to the Washington Post and the Boston papers are linking to LA. And, and, and it is for the good. And, 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 and that's it. That is a radical shift from a competitor's standpoint. But if you're looking at how can we elevate the conversation so that we're truly being um, 
informative, and those those pieces of information come from a variety of sources, and that speaks to diversity issues. That speaks to really understanding what people need versus what we think they want. Then that is a very big deal, um, and it's for sure. I can't do it all the time. <laughs> but it, it is a shift, but it's a shift that needs to happen. The other byproduct of um, uh, journalists um, combating the accusations, primarily from the White House, that we're all fake news, is that I think there's more solidarity between us. I mean, I, it's just a, a sense. It's maybe, in, um, I've done, done no study, but there seems to be while we're still um, healthily, healthily com competitive with one another, there's also more solidarity and there's groups that bring us together um, that are very strong in this city. And we have a very healthy Society of Professional Journalist chapters. We have a very, very bigger um, San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists and women communicators and black journalists that have a group. So there's been a sense of solidarity that has come from the attacks, um, which I think is a positive byproduct. And just to, we have some questions over here, but just to follow up, I'm wondering if you can sort of envision future, what, like, what the role of media will be once we have sort of a shakeout you know, once the dust has settled, so to speak, about what's happening now, can you look two years ahead? Can you look four years ahead? Or is that just still a crystal ball? Because things like, you know, not only is there immediacy right now with regard to news and getting news up there, but the global, I mean, we're so interdependent and interwoven that maybe we can't even, I don't know. Can, as a profession, you look one year, two year, five years, and think, what is the status and role of my industry post whatever I think that, um, I, you know, I, I have no idea what the 2020 election is going to look like. I have no idea what May's election is going to look like in a mayor's race or in a city council races or whatever. Uh, I, I don't think, I personally don't want to try to do the crystal ball thing in terms of that. What I hope is that more conversations like this will at least beget a little bit more civility with the opposing views. And I think that at the heart of what I've seen, and it hasn't just been in the last year and a half, but I, I feel like in the last really 10 years or so, there has been a shift toward incivility in uh, understanding and appreciating and then diving into diverse opinion. and. Um, so I think hopefully maybe what we've seen is we've gotten to the well, to the peak or to the valley, you know, use whatever metaphor you want. But we've gotten to we're we're at the bottom of the barrel on on the incivility and maybe these kinds of conversations happening with much more frequency than just once a year in January can help facilitate a better conversation that is really all about making the community a better, respectful community to one another. Um, what you said reminded me of something that um, uh, Jeff Jarvis wrote very recently after um, the real scandal at Der Spiegel, where um, a reporter at Der Spiegel was found to have invented multitudes of, of non-existent material and people, and, and it, was, it was very, very, very horrifying. Um, and, and it, he, he said, perhaps it's time to cut back on the whole notion of the narrative. I mean, we see ourselves as storytellers so often. And in order to suck you into some really heavy-duty issue, we want to give you a story that, that makes you, connects you with it. And he said, perhaps we, we need to step back from that narrative a little bit and think of, of the new role of journalists as to be those um, who, who help promote and help um, uh, create an informed conversation, an informed productive <coughs> conversation. I'm sorry, can you remember his whole phrase that he said? And I thought it was absolutely brilliant, and it's not just because our nonprofit mission is to promote facilitated, inclusive, civic conversation, but I really do believe 
that our role as journalists is to help people have a productive, civil conversation that informs them and helps them, empowers, be, them. empowers them, right, right, to be better members of, of society. So I, I hope that's that's part of the future, which is what you were saying. Okay. I was wondering, just piggybacking on that also, while other folks may think of questions. Um, when you said about the last 10 years, it's kind of rise in incivility, what role do you think, I mean, that's something I noticed about 10, maybe 12 years ago, was posting online comments with anonymity. There's something about anonymity that changes. There's not accountability. So I'm wondering if y'all, um, especially what you do, you're Oh, we've had a, a long conversations about um, Early, um, early ways that people could comment on our stories, yeah. and um, some people really just would um, hone in and and let it just germinate whenever somebody would say just horrible things about the reporting. Or, and you know, um, I never really paid much attention to them until someone said, "God, that guy is really awful on your story," <laughs> and he's going on and on. I mean, there's five comments, um, and we pull back on that a little, but everywhere else, it's so, um, anybody can make a comment. I'm, I'm more uh, shocked by those comments that come from people that, you can see they're tired, they're who they're married to, they don't care, they're making these shocking um, allegations and comments, and I know where he works, who he's married to, you know, on Facebook, he's all out there. That's what kind of sometimes shocks me. Commenting, can be very, very, very useful. And uh, we, we used to allow anonymous commenting. We got people who were being um, trolled. Well, I mean, we had someone who was uh, threatening to come down to the station. They had outed someone else. It was a big mess. We cut off commenting for a while. We changed vendors um, so that we could for some kind of, um, you keep, now you can't comment without registering, now there's always ways to game the system. But what I have found, and, and we've been really working with this over the last few months, uh, and, and especially the last couple months, is if someone from the staff monitors those, if, whether it's a reporter who wrote the story, or a producer, or a manager, or whatever, and we start engaging with the people who are commenting, a lot of times the negative or the trolls, the ugly, uh, the, the comments that don't forward the conversation, they start to die off. And then the conversation really does become a great way for us to be listening to our audience. And we, when we start to nurture that relationship, uh, to the earlier gentleman's question about how can he give us information about something if he sees it, go on our website and post post on a story, you know, post on almost any story that's locally produced that that something's happening that has anything to do with it, and we will find it. Um, we have, you know, you can email us, but when we started nurturing those comments, and it's not every story, uh, some Sometimes a wreck is just a wreck, you know? But um, when we started nurturing those comments, we got better comments. <laughs> it's funny because um, I've been doing the student publication at Palo Alto for the past 20 years, and one of the students this past semester, he said, you know, Miss, what people want is interaction, right? They don't really, the content is good, like that's what brings them to, but what they really want is the interaction. You need, y'all need to work on your interaction more. And I thought that was, from the mouth of babes, right? You know, he's right, because people want to feel listened to and heard. And I think as journalists, that's our job, right? To get out and to listen to people and get the stories. Um, the expression is, is behind on that. I was just talking to a colleague who has a friend at the Dallas Morning News who's on the team called engagement managers. And so all they do is engage people online to, you know, interact, um, come back to the side, click on us again. You know, follow us on Twitter, um, share our story on Facebook. So they're there uh, as part, not only to gain, gain readers, but I think when you gain more readers, you gain the subscribers, therefore you gain advertisers. So we had a question there. Hi, I'm, I'm coming to 
cheating because I am a journalist and I've worked for a, a couple of local publications and TV newsrooms and everything. But my question is uh, about false equivalencies and how sometimes, like, you could say that there's an echo chamber happening depending on what publications you subscribe to or the people that you follow on social media or on the internet, but they can be different. Like, if I'm, some people consider following the Washington Post and New York Times and major publications being part of an echo chamber while following Fox News and Drug Report, Drudge Report, like another echo chamber, Breitbart and things like that. But there is kind of a distinction, particularly when it comes to things that are true or false. And sometimes newsrooms can get uh, caught up in that. I once had an argument with a superior of mine because uh, I believe it was our former DA, Nico LaHood, was speaking about an anti-vaxxer documentary that was in town, and I could see you guys reacting to that. You guys remember this. And there was a debate about whether we should talk to anybody having to do with that documentary, and I was saying in the firm stance, no, we should not. It's propaganda that's been proven to be false that should not be a part of the story. And I got into basically a shouting match in the newsroom over that. Can you guys think of an example where saying something or defending something in the in, in sort of trying to be fair would have meant promoting something that is false? So, um, I don't know if you've heard of George Shapiro. <coughs> He's a um, uh, former professor at Berkeley, um, and he wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant, which talks about how we respond to news and information. And his latest um, um, instruction to these media people um, on how to deal with all of the falsehoods that are coming out is that we need to be providing a truth sandwich. Instead of repeating the falsehood and then saying it's, it's false, he says we should, we should say the truth. And then, without Amen. using those same words, use the, the false statement and then come back to the truth. And so start creating some truth sandwiches as opposed to the <laughs> BS of he said, she said, which is one college professors who just Amen. serves everybody except the reader. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I noticed, uh, maybe Bernice, maybe more qualified to talk about this, but I noticed that um, CNN and ABC News, when I watch their national broadcasts, that um, they, like Celia Vega has said, like, this is what the president said, um, that is not true. And that's something I have not. Oh, that's, said. that's very new. I have well, ne never seen that before. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> I've got a lot. There, this, there are lots of levels and layers to this particular uh, issue. So, that's actually something that has been going on a little bit longer, but they, they are being much more overt on some of the, uh, the ABC, CNNs, the NBCs, the CBN, you know, I mean, any, everybody is, 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 okay. Anyway, but yeah, uh, but uh, that started out actually with the Washington Post, they started with the Pinocchio Report. And that started years ago. That started with, I think, it, I don't know if it, the, if it was President Clinton, I think it was Clinton. So, and they would do a thing where they would visually tell you how long the Pinocchio nose got, depending on the lies that were coming out, or the untruths, or the half truths, or the partial truths, or the whatever. And so, yes, there is much more, and I think it goes to Elaine's um, point, that it seems like journalists, and I will say specifically national media outlets, are kind of, they got each other's backs a little bit. Um, to an extent when they're talking about, well, he said this and he reported this to so-and-so, no, you know, I'm coming to Jack, uh, to Acosta's defense when he gets called out and, and barred by the White House or whatever the case may be. And then there's the perspective of the little ABC affiliate in San Antonio who, and I just had this very interesting conversation in our newsroom about this very thing. We are an ABC affiliate. We are also a CNN affiliate. We run ABC stories or CNN stories in our newscasts, and CNN content is part of our website. 
and CNN and ABC are both routinely called out for being more liberal leaning than a Fox or a Drudge or whatnot. NBC gets the same, uh, MSNBC and all of that. And it, more than anything else, the complaints and the phone calls I get, and I'm the public editor of our newsroom because that's who I am, we don't have a public editor, so I get those calls. It is, you reported something that CNN had, and it is false. You didn't tell the whole truth. That's only part of the truth. You, ABC, is routinely doing X, Y, or Z. It is to the point that several people in our newsroom have questioned very openly during a loud, good, very healthy conversation in our newsroom today. Should we be using ABC or CNN content on our website because we are not in Washington? There are issues of trying to make sure that we are getting all of the information and we are getting all sides and that we're not uh, uh, repeating falsehoods or repeating half-truths. And as a local news organization, should we just stay in our quote-unquote lane and be really going and doubling down on local news, especially on our website, which can get shared, and it can get misconstrued, and it can get, you know, pieces taken out of context. I don't have the answer. It's certainly a conversation that we probably need to have on a larger level, and that, again, goes back to cross-posting and being open to uh, multiple media uh, voices and saying, okay, this is one perspective, here's another perspective, and here's a third perspective, because it's not just black or white, very many shades of gray in between. So it, that it's, you're right that you have seen a lot more of the, this is what he said that is patently false, this is what he, he said that is absolutely true, you know, whatever the case may be, but even that may not be enough at times. But there are wells in San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> the Alamo Wall. How many of y'all have seen the movie The Post? Yeah. If you haven't, I recommend that you see it. But one of the things that Ben Bradley said in that movie, and I'm sure I read Catherine um, Graham's autobiography, which is also worth reading if you haven't read it. But Bradley said, if we don't hold them accountable, who will? And I think that's the role of journalists, is to hold those in power accountable. Also, Carl Bernstein, from Woodward Bernstein, who wrote the Watergate story, I saw him recently, like, it was a Nowcast kind of event. Did you see that interview? And what he what he said, yeah, it was great. If you, you can just Google Carl Bernstein, you know, I can't remember what event he was at, but... He basically said that journalists have to call out the lies. And I think that was almost, maybe that's why we're seeing more of it, because they're finally saying, you know, people don't have time to do all the research. We have got to do it for them and say that's false. And not repeat their and not, first. Right, and not repeat the, repeat the falsehoods. And let's do, we can have maybe wrap up comments, because um, we're getting close to the end. And then we have just a moment of appreciation from our board chair. That's that. Um, okay. um, well, that kind of dovetails into what I was going to say anyway. Um, so, my, before I returned to San Antonio a few months ago, I was working in Washington, D.C. I arrived um, a couple of days before President Trump's inauguration, and um, I, I was in the newsroom uh, for a publication education week. Um, it's a nonprofit that's been around since 1981, um, <clears throat> and it got started right when the first education secretary had taken office. Um, when um, Reagan, you know, had, had also taken office. And so they've seen a lot. Uh, there's folks that have been there almost the whole time. And they were telling me just the, the, the trying to figure out in the last two years how to keep up with the news cycle is something that they just never envisioned. And there are so many, it's like we're needed more than ever. There aren't enough of us. And yet we're still struggling to like, what, where do we put what in the news cycle? Do we write about the border? Do we write about Russia? Do we write about... Um, Stormy Daniels, like, what, what figures where, you know, and um, recently I was just watching with my mom a documentary about the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton scandal, and you just see, like, how much has changed in those 20 years. You see the seeds of what was happening, 
and they have a lot of infotainment, and I think that it's been a slow path in our politics for that. So it's um, going to really take, I feel like, a marriage of the citizenry and journalists coming together to really prioritize, you know, what is important to us. And sometimes, you know, things have to get worse before they get better. Um, and I think anyone up here, we're here because we're eternal optimists in a way, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and I think people really crave good news and community news, and I think that that's just something that we have to kind of, we can't lose sight of in, in the midst of all this. Um, but the silver lining is that I feel people care more than ever about policy and government. I think um, if the administration, if the different administration, I don't know if we have as many people looking up how to vote and how to register um, and uh, you know how to support a local news organization. Um, and so uh, I see a lot of young people at TPR events, and um, that encourages me that you know there, there still is hope there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm also an incredible optimist. I mean, I'm continuing, I, I used to say I have bangs to cover up the brick wall shape against in my forehead from <laughs> continuing to believe that we can, we can make it through. But, um, and, I, and I do believe that, that media, nonprofit, for-profit, media will, will prevail because I think, once again, this, this administration has helped to underscore the importance and particularly the importance of local media. I mean, you you have a lot more um, ability to trust somebody who is local because, you know, as you said, you know, we're not in Washington. What do we know? But what we do know when to trust local media. And and what I'm also seeing that I love is is the collaborative nature um, as as the the large organizations get smaller and some organizations just flat disappear, leaving you know media leaving these deserts out there. Um, the collaboration, to me, I, I find it to be really, really terrific. And I came from a really, really competitive background with the Dallas Times Herald and the Dallas Morning News, one of the late, one of the best newspaper wars in the country. Um, but, you know, in the end, it didn't end well for the Dallas Times Herald or for the San Antonio Light or for the Houston Post. And, and the world is, is less good because of that. What I see cropping up and the, the partnerships gives me a lot. Uh, I guess final <laughs> final thoughts are um, every now and then go ahead and give a journalist a break or give us a hug. <laughs> uh, it is it is not the easiest job. It is a good job. It is a a calling, and it is such a necessary thing that we do. We we do not go out trying to get it wrong. We always go out to try to get it right. Um, and I would say, continue to do this kind of thing. Continue to come to uh, places or have conversations where you can learn from one another, from people in your community, about uh, the, the, the importance of continued dialogue, because that's, I think, where the, you know, the truth is always going to come out. It's just, it's, it sometimes needs to take a little time to, to get pulled out uh, in, those, in those various conversations. I too am hopeful because I am also an eternal optimist and I do think the students coming up are engaged. They're paying attention. They are registering to vote. They're taking an active part in society and that's what we want. So I think as journalists, um, the more that we can get citizens interested and at the table, the better off we're going to be as a society. So thanks for being here because that's part of it, right? Um, all the things they said. Um, and, you know, I think we don't have a healthy democracy if we don't have journalism, right? We need journalism right, to be a part of like, our society and our community. So, so what you can do I mean, because you're here in the room, is you can appreciate good journalism, first of all. Um, share it. Like, when you see a story that, you know, calmly Lane writes, it's clearly labeled commentary, so, you know, it, it's, it's her opinion. You know, when you see a good story that touches you or that points out something important, you can share that. Not only just share it, but you can say, like, this is what good journalism looks like, right? This, um, advocate for the journalism that's being done. Um, and, you know, tell your friends, 
share anything about it that's on Snow because that's not real. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a, uh, a browser extension um, on my browser called the BS Detector, <laughs> which is very helpful because when you call up a site, if it's questionable, it says the site may not be a reliable source. It's like a quick way to do it. So it's a BS Detector too. Well, I'm an eternal optimist because I've been at the paper for 11 years without getting a raise and I still love <laughs> it. Um, uh, we die hard. Um, and uh, you're our ambassadors now. You're, um, you, you get that from us today in that you have learned from people who do this that we're just regular people. We're, we get things wrong sometimes. We, we have to correct it. That's our policy. And, um, and the fake news um, uh, slogan has become all too easy to, you know, to throw around um, thoughtlessly. And, um, and a lot of times it doesn't hurt one bit. We go on. After a while, there's just so much a person can sustain, you know? Um, so be our ambassadors, um, be our champions, um, write a letter to the editor. I'm, I'm really old school about it. There, there is really nothing as great as getting an angry letter to the editor and then the editorial page editor decides to publish it. I love it. <laughs> that means I got you that wild up that you put pen to paper and send it in with to the paper. And um, the nice ones are great too. But um, we want to be read. We want to have a discussion. We that's all we do all day. We listen to each other. We have a discussion. We, dis we disagree with what each, each other, and then we go out to coffee with each other. So that's what we want with you. Thank you, Kurtis. Swahia Kara, who is our board chair, and we are going to take a few moments just to say thank you. We have just some tokens of appreciation um, to provide for you, and really appreciate all the time that they have taken. We've been in conversation for two months, at least two yeah. months, and so this wasn't something that just came together. They have put a lot of thought and energy and reflection and drawing on years of experience. So heartfelt, deepest thanks. Oh, and I think as a Soul Center, we can pledge to try to create more conversations like this, so it's not just a once a year event. So be engaged, be involved, we'll be offering more things. You might be getting more emails from me, so be prepared. Um. I will stand here so I can see all of you. So I know, and I know this for a fact, that it is very difficult to get a hold of just one of you. <laughs> so to actually have six of you here on a weeknight is nothing short of a miracle. So could we just give them a round of applause? <laughs> and um, I would like to, on behalf of the Soul Center Board and Greece, I will just go ahead and, and make myself on your behalf as well. <laughs> Um, really, really, truly, from the bottom of our hearts, thank not only our panel, but our executive director, Don Martin, Dr. Don Martin. We that to very little couple. So, Don, thank you. Thank you, guys. And we have a very small token of appreciation for each one of you. And you know we have a hidden agenda. So every time you see it on your desk, you'll be like, oh, I should go back to the Soul Center and do something for it, right? And before we let these wonderful people go, how many of you think this panel, uh, this discussion, should really be an annual event? Amen. You can raise hands. You can raise hands. I think the majority wins here. All right, so we'll just put it, put it on show three week out. And we really appreciate how you have this as an open forum and really discuss not just the issues that are relevant to you but also to the audience. And um, we welcome you and, and thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you all. Okay. So, Charlotte? <laughs> it just may be, you have to rub it and see, is this good?
have been celebrated. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.